So our topic is how can the free trade area help to strengthen Africa's position in the global uh, economy? And um, I'll systematically try to uh, answer this uh, question. Um, I'll be doing this uh, firstly um, by uh, making the point that the um, uh, AFCFTA, the African Continental Free Trade uh, Area Agreement, uh, really is the tool, the main tool for strengthening Africa's uh, trade position uh, in the global uh, arena. Um, I had uh, ha prepared a few slides on um, the AFCFTA state of play, but in the light of your discussions yesterday, I think we can um, uh, skip those. I will then talk uh, about the AFCFTA's expected impact because that's part of answering the, the question, how we could strengthen the position of African countries. Um, I will also try to contextualize uh, where we are now in relation to the uh, current uh, pandemic. And then uh, I'll come to the heart of the uh, question, uh, which is now looking beyond the FCFTA and the broader uh, sort of global uh, context. And I'll end uh, with a few words on um, uh, ECA's uh, support uh, for the AFCFTA. Uh, as moderator uh, pointed out, I do uh, work for the uh, UN Economic Commission for Africa and the African Trade Policy Center, and we're very much involved in providing uh, support, and I'd like to elaborate on that uh, uh, a bit. Now, um, the rationale, of course, of the AFCFTA is that um, it's an effort to consolidate um, Africa's uh, um, uh, 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 countries into one uh, uh, preferential trade uh, market. Um, the uh, African economy coll collectively uh, amounts to uh, some 2.5 uh, trillion in, in GDP. Uh, this is, uh, we should point out, is just um, over half of Germany's uh, GDP, uh, just to put things uh, in, in perspective. Uh, so that gives you um, some uh, idea of why it is necessary to consolidate uh, such a fragmented market uh, of um, uh, some 55 uh, countries. Uh, into a preferential uh, trade uh, zone. And so this is what the AFCFTA really is trying to do. Of course, this effort at integration is not new in, on the African continent. Um, it's uh, an ongoing effort uh, in the form of the regional economic uh, communities. Uh, but if Africa's collective GDP is only about half that of Germany's, you can understand then that even at the sub-regional level, uh, the country economy is really uh, still small in terms of um, benefiting from uh, scale economies, uh, economies of scope, um, in terms of benefiting from the kind of innovation that can take place uh, in a, a bigger economic uh, environment, uh, and, and also obviously in terms of the market uh, itself. So um, uh, this is an effort to go beyond what um, African countries have been doing in their respective uh, RECs, to try to consolidate the continent as a whole uh, into one uh, trading zone. Let me also just add that trade uh, on the continent is relatively low. I think we all know that, uh, under um, just under 16% uh, or so for the period um, uh, 2015 to 2018, for which we, there is reliable uh, data. And um, uh, it's also an effort to try to grow this uh, trade. And I'll be coming uh, back to this uh, uh, point. Um, also, um, we have to uh, keep in mind that um, before the pandemic, uh, six of the top 10 uh, fastest growing economies were in Africa. Um, the uh, uh, population size is uh, so 1.3 uh, billion, and uh, that's projected to uh, increase uh, significantly, um, uh, almost double by 2060. And um, we expected to see some uh, significant growth in, in GDP as well uh, during the next uh, uh, 40 years. So basically, this is also planning um, for um, what we expect to see as changes on the 
African continent. Uh, of course, you need to begin uh, to sow the seeds uh, if um, you are going to reap the fruit uh, later. So this also you can see this effort at the AFCFT as part of sowing uh, these uh, seeds. Um, another uh, important uh, consideration uh, to take into account in talking about the uh, AFCFTA is uh, to recognize that um, African economies are underdeveloped. Um, I think we now all understand the limitations of um, uh, resource-based uh, uh, economies. Uh, uh, we all understand that um, uh, there's need for significant uh, uh, structural shift in the economy um, uh, to have a sustainable growth and uh, to have um, uh, a modernized uh, uh, economic uh, framework. Um, and uh, the FCFTA is expected to help in this process to drive Africa's industrialization, to drive this kind of structural shift that we are looking for uh, in, in the uh, economy. Uh, we all know that uh, countries have uh, hardly been able to develop without uh, industrializing, uh, a shorthand form for saying without structural shifts in the uh, e economy. Um, and um, uh, when you look at the, uh, uh, the Africa's uh, trade, we find that um, about 65% of uh, the exports uh, that's going um, outside the continent uh, 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 mainly uh, extractives, uh, compared to uh, only about 35% of such uh, exports within uh, the continent. Uh, even though intra-African trade is relatively small, what we are finding is that the evidence shows that um, uh, that small uh, share of trade is nonetheless uh, uh, has considerable value added uh, aspects uh, to it. And that's the kind of trade that you want to grow. And obviously to grow that trade, you want to make sure that you're removing the uh, impediments, you're, moving, you're removing uh, tariff and non-tariff barriers, uh, uh, dealing with infrastructure constraints, uh, dealing with uh, uh, red tape at the border, trade facilitation, et cetera, to be able to grow uh, that um, uh, uh, trade. Uh, so that too is uh, rational for the uh, AFCFTA. Um, then if you look outside of the African continent, you look um, uh, globally, um, what you find is that uh, as much as uh, we all um, adhere to the multilateral system, nonetheless, uh, regionalism um, and uh, promoting regional trade uh, is very much uh, part of the global uh, landscape. And we have seen uh, the, this um, uh, emerge, especially in the last uh, couple of decades, we are seeing um, a strong uh, regional shift, a strong regional uh, emphasis. And I also have to say that the success of the European Union has been an inspiration uh, to uh, others uh, in this uh, regard. Uh, most recently, of course, um, we have seen the, uh, uh, the uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic uh, Partnership um, uh, uh, taking, taking off uh, uh, and this map, uh, it shows India as part of it, but um, of course we know that India uh, opted out of joining the uh, ICEP, uh, but we, you know, it's not clear, of course, whether this is a permanent uh, opt out or, um, or that could come uh, later. But nonetheless, the point that I'm trying to make is that um, we have seen uh, uh, this kind of shift and um, on the African continent, there is a strong case then for cohering African trade policy uh, for um, achieving some level of coherence, uh, given uh, the way that the rest of the world is going. And of course, in the context of this pandemic, uh, we have seen uh, a much more introspective uh, approach uh, to trade, uh, and that is still being uh, played out. It's something we could also come, come back to. Um, these are the slides I'm going to skip uh, since um, there's been discussion of this, the AFCFT state of play, um, the, uh, where the um, negotiations are and uh, uh, ratifications, etc. But only on ratification, just to uh, make one point, and that is of the 34 countries that have ratified up to this point, uh, they account for something like 75% of Africa's GDP. So I think we need to also keep this um, in perspective that the biggest economies, of course, um, 
Nigeria, South Africa, Egypt, uh, Kenya, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Morocco, others uh, are all uh, uh, have all ratified. Uh, so about 75% of Africa's GDP is already committed to this uh, uh, trade uh, agreement. Um, now, uh, I'd like to share with you our assessment of the expected impact of the AFCFTA. And this, of course, is uh, part of answering uh, this question of um, how uh, can the free trade area uh, strengthen Africa's uh, position uh, globally. Um, in terms of own economic modeling, which is quite consistent with other uh, efforts that we have seen in modeling the impact of the FCFTA. And here, parenthetically, I could just mention that the World Bank, the IMF, ONCTAD, um, in particular, have uh, released their own uh, uh, studies, uh, which are all going in the, in the same uh, direction. But um, in terms of our own um, uh, modeling of the um, expected uh, impact, uh, the first uh, conclusion that we arrived at is that um, Africa's GDP and exports would increase. And this is for all countries. Um, uh, suddenly, from our perspective, it's not correct uh, to say that it's only the big countries that uh, benefit. Uh, this is not supported by at least the evidence that we have, uh, that all countries benefit in Africa, the least developed countries, as well as developing countries, uh, all uh, benefit uh, from the uh, AFCFTA. Of course, depending on the kinds of um, policies and measures that they put in place to uh, actually leverage uh, these uh, benefits from the AFCFTA. Um, uh, the other point um, uh, would like to make is that um, uh, um, we are also likely to see an increase in intra-African exports relative to um, exports uh, with uh, the rest of the uh, with the rest of the world and this um, obviously is one of the rationale of uh, creating a preferential uh, trade uh, uh, area uh, so the benefits are very much uh, centered on intra african uh, trade um, and uh, what i'm going to show in this uh, slide uh, again from our modeling is that um, uh, depending on the level of ambition um, uh, at which the uh, modalities that have already been agreed are um, implemented, uh, you can have a significant uh, a change in intra-African uh, exports as of compared to a baseline without the FCFTA uh, in, in place. And here, let me just explain that um, uh, although uh, the modalities are clear that for trading goods, um, they start at uh, liberalization of 90% uh, of uh, tariff lines and um, uh, another 7% uh, sensitive products that are allowed uh, but to be phased out over time and 3% excluded products. Now, because intra-African trade is relatively small, uh, even uh, excluding, uh, even, even temporarily, 1% uh, um, of tariff lines could um, result in a situation where uh, much of what is excluded is actually what is uh, being traded among the African uh, countries. So this is what gives us a low ambition, intermediate ambition, and high ambition scenario. We know that the... Um, Tariff schedules uh, are being in the process of being uh, finalized, so we need to see those uh, to be much clearer on uh, what the um, impact uh, would be. Uh, but in the absence of um, uh, that data on the actual uh, tariff uh, com commitments, we just um, uh, outlined these uh, three scenarios, the low ambition, intermediate, and high ambition. Taking into account also that the modalities do provide for an anti-concentration Clause uh, that is that um, uh, it should not just be 90% uh, of tariff lines that uh, being uh, liberalized, but also 90% of trade to deal with this problem of um, excluding uh, products that are actually being uh, traded. But as I said, we have not yet seen all the data on this, but in the absence of that, this is what we uh, uh, came up with that um, you're going to see a significant. Uh, 
increase in uh, all the main uh, sectors uh, with the AFCFTA uh, in place. Even with the low ambition scenario, you still would have a significant uh, uh, increase, um, whether it's in agriculture and food, energy and mining, industry, uh, and also services, of course, which we were, we did not model, but which we're highlighting uh, here. I'll come back to this point about um, uh, services, uh, uh, which, as I say, was not actually uh, modeled, uh, given the difficulties with data, etc. Um, now, uh, in regard to uh, uh, tariff um, uh, revenue and uh, welfare, uh, of course, um, our modeling shows that um, uh, you're likely to see uh, a significant um, decrease in tariff revenues, uh, you know, uh, obviously as, uh, uh, as, the, as the tariffs are, are brought down. Um, but um, we are also projecting that um, this decrease uh, is offset uh, to a large extent by um, overall uh, welfare. And again, this is for all three uh, scenarios that we uh, model. Uh, I know that efforts are being made uh, to um, provide uh, a facility to deal with adjustment uh, uh, issues, uh, and that obviously would help. Uh, but you know, obviously, uh, with a decrease in, uh, in 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 the tariffs, uh, you would also have a decrease in uh, tariff uh, revenues. Uh, so just to pull uh, these uh, main uh, points uh, together uh, in terms of the expected impacts of the uh, AFCFTA, um, what we're suggesting from our own modeling uh, is that um, uh, uh, you would uh, see a significant uh, impact on uh, intra-African uh, trade. As I said, we did not consider services we did not consider the removal of non-tariff uh, barriers. So logically, that would tell you that if you also have um, a significant uh, liberalization of services, and I'll come back to this uh, a little later, and um, if you're making significant progress on uh, the removal of non-tariff barriers, you would expect to see the uh, multiplication of the, uh, of, of the gains. Um, uh, uh, and I'm just uh, highlighting here that uh, studies that we have carried out and uh, providing the references at the end, uh, look at this uh, very carefully and uh, uh, to uh, uh, share the, um, uh, these uh, results. Um, I should also point out that we're uh, currently also uh, working on a more comprehensive uh, assessment that will take into account uh, trading goods, trading services, the NTBs, uh, the impact on poverty, and also on climate change. Um, uh, here, let me uh, just emphasize that um, uh, obviously we'd like to take the work that we have done further. Uh, but um, uh, beyond that, we would like to also look at distributional uh, issues. Uh, we are aware that um, an effort has been made in this um, regard, uh, especially by the World Bank's own modeling. Um, although, of course, we think that uh, uh, it could be improved and uh, hopefully uh, when we come out with our own study, uh, we'll be able to show the improvements over what the World Bank has put out. And um, uh, obviously, as we are looking at um, implementing the AFCFTA during this decade of the 2020s, a clear defining characteristic of this decade uh, is uh, in addition to digitalization, it's going to be uh, climate uh, uh, change, how you deal with this um, uh, environmental crisis that is facing uh, the planet. And um, we want to make this argument uh, as we look at, the, as we model uh, uh, the impact uh, uh, much more deeply than we have done so far, uh, to be able to factor in uh, issues around climate change, the liberalization of environmental goods and services, and how that could enhance uh, the gains uh, from the uh, AFCFTA. Of course, uh, the African continent is uh, not uh, primarily responsible uh, for the um, uh, state of global warming uh, that we have seen uh, uh, in recent years on, on, the, on the planet. But nonetheless, we do feel that um, uh, going forward into the future, 
uh, we should be looking at uh, this issue of sustainability and that it would actually benefit the um, uh, the African countries as they seek this uh, to make this shift, this structural shift in their economies as they seek to industrialize, that a greener uh, form of industrialization actually uh, would be more beneficial. So we are factoring this issue very much into the work that is uh, ongoing, uh, which we expect to be able to release uh, by next uh, spring. Um, uh, of course, also, um, uh, uh, the point that I made earlier that uh, the um, for the FCFTA to have the kind of impact on industrialization, the exclusion list, um, the sensitive uh, uh, list, uh, which are transitional exclusion list could be permanent, uh, the 3% uh, uh, could be permanent depending on further reviews of the, uh, of the uh, agreement. And the modalities, um, uh, but you know, basically, we're making the point that um, really, for us to see the kind of impact, the gains uh, that we'd like to see, um, then especially those products that uh, intermediates uh, should be among those that uh, uh, liberalize early in the in the process. This is what will stimulate the um, regional value chains that we'd like to see, and that could build upon. Uh, the uh, AFCFTA. And this is also one of the areas where least developed countries uh, can make significant gains. As I said earlier, uh, from our modeling, we see a potential for um, least developed countries to gain as much as developing uh, 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 African countries. But all of this also depends on how these modalities uh, are applied. Um, and that's the point about the LD LDCs need not fear. Uh, the AFCFTA, uh, but again, uh, it depends on the details on uh, how the uh, modalities uh, uh, play out. Um, there are a number of other factors uh, which need to be emphasized uh, because these gains that we're talking about are not automatic. I've already talked about uh, the policies, complementary policies and so on. And uh, here we want to highlight uh, education and skills. Uh, uh, obviously uh, going to be important, especially also as we're seeing this shift that has uh, been um, accelerated by the current pandemic uh, towards digitalization and so on. So uh, this issue of human capital um, uh, is uh, central to, uh, the, to, to um, understand the gains that we are uh, projecting. Um, and uh, also, of course, the kind of support that the private sector needs, uh, ongoing improvements in the business climate, uh, in the investment climate, and, and, and so on, uh, that these are also critical uh, to be able to see these uh, gains. So in other words, what I'm saying here, we do um, uh, expect to see these gains, but they are not automatic. It all depends on all these uh, caveats that we're uh, uh, emphasizing. Uh, Wise also pointing out that um, we uh, will be coming out with another study uh, that will look at these issues in uh, greater uh, depth. Uh, now I'd like to just pivot and make a few comments on the current uh, situation in which we find ourselves in relation to the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And, um, uh, and then before going on to uh, uh, address the central uh, question in this uh, presentation and then uh, draw my uh, conclusions. Um, you know, of course, as you know, the pandemic they, uh, affected uh, what was being planned for the uh, start of, um, of, of trading. Um, and then, of course, we know that uh, there's been uh, uh, the sort of momentum in economic growth that you are seeing on the continent has uh, uh, so, somewhat been disrupted although the outlook now for uh, 2021 is beginning to look more uh, uh, promising. Um, uh, we have uh, already uh, highlighted that one of the lessons uh, that we should take uh, going forward uh, out of the um, uh, pandemic is um, uh, to look again at the way we have prioritized uh, the um, services uh, for early uh, liberalization. We have been making the case uh, in the last few months uh, that health and education uh, should be prioritized along with the other five priority services uh, sectors. 
we were quite encouraged when at the um, recent uh, AU Extraordinary Summit, the um, uh, champion for the AFCFTA, the president of Niger, picked this up and uh, did in fact uh, allude to this, that um, uh, this is something that should be considered. Um, we do feel that um, having a common, a common approach, common policies, uh, opening up these uh, sectors uh, uh, could uh, support uh, the um, need for um, uh, sustained uh, uh, impact on, on, on human uh, capital. Uh, uh, so this is part of our, our thinking uh, here. Of course, health also has an education dimension. Um, since um, health education is the basis for creating the skills that are needed for this uh, uh, sector. And of course, also education, as I've just mentioned, uh, the sort of skills that are needed, that um, by opening these sectors up for investment, um, for um, common policies across the uh, continent, uh, for the movement of people uh, across the continent um, uh, in um, accessing uh, health and education uh, markets, also for um, uh, taking into account the technological ad advances in the way that health and education can be delivered, that this could have a positive uh, impact on these um, uh, conditions that are needed to make the FCFTA uh, a success. Uh, and so we have, put, we have been putting much uh, attention on this. And um, next year we'll be coming out with uh, some studies that will focus on, on these two sectors in particular to highlight uh, the importance that we feel that they need to be given uh, as the AFCFTA uh, is uh, implemented. Um, also, uh, I've mentioned uh, the importance of uh, digitalization and um, uh, we have been advocating for the uh, negotiations on e-commerce uh, to be front-loaded uh, and uh, to be dealt with um, alongside uh, the um, phase two uh, issues. Uh, because again, we feel that having a common approach on uh, digitalization, dealing with um, many of the issues that are not really fully resolved on the African continent as regards policy, uh, that this would be helpful in um, uh, bringing countries uh, to the same level in regard to policies on digitalization. And of course, central to that is the issue of um, uh, e-commerce. And here I should just also add that um, some surveys that we undertook uh, during the, um, uh, the, at the height of the COVID crisis, uh, especially between the months of um, May and July uh, of um, uh, MSMEs, uh, what we found that nearly two thirds of the firms that were uh, interviewed uh, did um, allude to um, pivoting to digital solutions uh, in their business. Um, a, common, a common heard uh, refrain these days is that uh, this um, pandemic crisis has uh, accelerated uh, the use of digital tools by about um, uh, five years. Uh, in the space of the nine months that we have been dealing with the uh, with, with the pandemic. And this is certainly um, borne out by uh, our own surveys of, um, of businesses on the African continent, uh, what they're, they're telling us. And this is another reason why it's important to have an adequate policy framework as um, digitalization continues to grow um, on the uh, uh, continent as businesses um, uh, results to the use of digital uh, uh, skills, uh, tools. Um, then, of course, uh, given the fact that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've seen a negative impact on economic growth, on uh, several sectors that have been struggling, um, services sectors like tourism, of course, uh, uh, the hospitality sector and all this, that um, uh, depending on how the FCFTA is implemented, this could also be a boost to growth uh, and to the recovery uh, that we're expecting uh, to take off uh, as of um, next uh, next year. Um, now I want to come to the uh, heart of um, the issue that I was asked to um, uh, address, uh, uh, which is um, uh, 
uh, how the AFCFTA uh, could um, strengthen Africa's uh, global uh, position. Um, I've already alluded to the fact that um, uh, we are seeing uh, this um, uh, regionalization uh, in, 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 of trade agreements and, and so on. Although, of course, um, uh, despite this, we, we all understand and do know uh, that the multilateral trading system is uh, uh, sets uh, standards and is important also for um, uh, uh, looking at global uh, trade uh, issues. Uh, uh, and of course, several other um, uh, activities that is undertaken at the, at the level of the WTO, including, of course, uh, trade uh, surveillance, uh, the research uh, on uh, uh, trade trends and, and, and so on. All of these, of course, are important. Uh, we know that um, uh, these are uh, all part of the jewels that you can find in the, in the WTO. Uh, but nonetheless, we are seeing this uh, regional uh, uh, trend. Um, it's also clear to us that um, regional trade cannot be Africa's only strategy. Um, it can be a central, central to the strategy, but of course it cannot be the uh, only uh, strategy. And um, uh, Africa today is, in, uh, is not in a good position uh, with uh, a share of only about 3% of um, global trade, which is um, almost where it was uh, even two decades ago. Um, now, although, uh, as I pointed out uh, from our modeling and other evidence and so on, uh, we, all, we can all agree that the um, continental market provides um, uh, strong opportunities for African uh, countries, um, I think we can also say that uh, these opportunities are not ample enough to significantly increase Africa's uh, position on the uh, uh, world uh, trade uh, landscape. So it's clear to us that uh, African economies also need to open up to partners outside the continent, even as it is pursuing uh, this um, trade integration within uh, the continent. And of course, there are many benefits that go with this, uh, including uh, technology, know-how, skills, upgrading, um, greater impact on competitiveness, et cetera. So we all know uh, what those uh, benefits uh, um, but uh, our argument here is that um, the issue really is uh, over the sequencing of um, how Africa opens up to the rest of the economy, even as it is integrating uh, internally. And um, again, uh, it's good, you know, to rely on the evidence. Uh, what does the evidence tell us? Uh, when you look at the uh, data, you uh, uh, undertake modeling, uh, what does the evidence uh, uh, tell us? Uh, and especially in regard to the economic partnership agreements. Uh, here, let me um, just pause to say that um, uh, I don't want to be misunderstood as bringing up the EPAs, uh, as to uh, bash the EPAs, uh, etc. cetera. It's, uh, it's nothing as, uh, as crude as, as, as that. Um, but all the same, I think the reason for bringing up the EPAs is that um, we have seen a trend that um, where Europe goes, the rest of the world tends to follow. We have seen this in the uh, regional uh, the regionalism, uh, and then we have literally seen it in the way that um, other partners are looking at emulating uh, what Europe is, is doing on the African continent as regards uh, trade uh, policy. Uh, so we are seeing the UK, for example, uh, literally cutting and pasting uh, EU trade agreements. Uh, we have seen the US, uh, uh, make, making it quite explicit that um, uh, whilst it has given Africa um, uh, concessions, in, including through uh, AGOA, uh, Africa has given the market access to Europe. And that, that is a quotation from a US uh, trade uh, representative. Uh, we have seen other players like China, India also going in the direction 
that the EU has started. So I think this is the reason for the concern that um, clearly the EU is being emulated by other partners. And we're not sure that that is beneficial for the continent as a whole. And this is integral to this question of um, uh, Africa's uh, uh, positioning Africa uh, in the global uh, economy. Um, but very quickly, specifically as regards the EPAs, uh, our own analysis shows that the gains are really uh, paltry. Um, most of the countries on the African continent, uh, the LDCs already have everything but, arm, but arms. Uh, and those that do not, uh, basically uh, the gains of the efforts uh, we have shown and fully implemented is just concentrated in a few uh, sectors like rice, milk, sugar, uh, meat, and, and, and so on. Uh, of course, this for the uh, non-LDCs. Uh, um, increase in exports, particularly in these sectors, uh, we have shown would come at an expense to African uh, trade. Um, but um, our analysis further shows that uh, if the AFCFTA is in place, is being implemented, and I underline these ifs, uh, if it's in place, it's been implemented as we expect, uh, then um, the gains from the EPAs will be fully preserved, uh, 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 assuming, of course, that intra uh, the intra-African trade integration, the foundation is fully laid, and that is already uh, uh, taking off as uh, uh, expected. Uh, so, as I said, uh, the key issue is not about whether African countries should have, should sign or have or, or have signed uh, the EPAs, but it's really about the place of the uh, reforms. Uh, whether or not the AFCFTA uh, is in place uh, to mitigate uh, the negative effects from the EPAs as Africa, of course, opens up, opens up in this um, uh, um, uh, uh, reciprocal uh, um, uh, 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 agreement, which in, in fact the uh, EPAs uh, is. So you're dealing with uh, asymmetries, of course, um, between the... Um, uh, African countries and, and Europe, uh, and then you throw reciprocity into this. Uh, basically, what we're saying here is that um, if the FCFTA is uh, in place, it is working as we expect it to be working, there is scope to bring in this kind of um, reciprocity into the, uh, uh, the trade relationship with the uh, African uh, countries. And which also underscores the point I made that it's not... Uh, that Africa should uh, close itself to the rest of the world and uh, Europe a major uh, trade and investment partner, not at all. It's just a question of the sequence of the, um, of, of the reforms. Um, uh, so this is uh, to underscore the point that um, you know, that surely uh, opening up beyond the continent is important, but um, uh, what is it, what um, uh, the issue really is, is about um, this, uh, this question of um, uh, uh, sequencing. Uh, and um, if we are also saying that the AFCFTA could be part of the growth strategy for the continent uh, post uh, COVID-19, then clearly the top priority should be uh, to establish the uh, AFCFTA. Um, and then Africa will be in a better position to open up to the outside uh, partners. Um, here also let me say that uh, part of the problem is um, Europe's incentives uh, to Africa. Um, and basically what I mean by this is that um, uh, by uh, making market access a condition for the EPAs, for the, you know, for the um, non-LDCs, the African non-LDCs, basically uh, the message to these countries is that um, uh, you need to uh, uh, renege uh, on the commitments you're making, the integration commitments you're making if you want our market access. And so that's the position that countries like uh, Kenya, uh, to give one example, uh, finds itself in when it's already in a customs union with others, uh, but basically it is being forced uh, to um, 
enter into a market access uh, agreement, which um, does not make sense uh, since it's already part of a, a customs union with other partners that are not part of that um, agreement. So it's a question of really the incentives that Europe is putting uh, on the uh, uh, on the table. Uh, so now let me um, uh, conclude then by saying that uh, um, uh, our view is that uh, the integration, the trade integration should take priority. I would say that um, the AFCFTA needs to be given about uh, four to five years um, for implementation to take off. And um, I would say that um, the second half of this decade would be the kind of timing uh, that would be optimal uh, for um, these reciprocal uh, trade um, agreements with uh, other partners, not just Europe, but also uh, the um, other partners. And in the meantime, in my view, what would make sense is for the perverse incentives that are being given to some African countries uh, to um, prioritize these external agreements over their internal integration commitments, that these uh, perverse incentives need to be uh, uh, reversed. Now, let me conclude by uh, with just a few words on um, uh, what we're doing at ECA to uh, support uh, the um, uh, ongoing FCFTA uh, processes. Um, uh, and here, uh, of course, uh, we um, are following the uh, uh, phase two uh, issues, uh, the first two negotiations, um, and we continue to do analytical work, as I said, uh, in regard to these uh, uh, phase two uh, issues, phase two and phase three issues, phase three, of course, being e-commerce. Uh, although, as I did mention earlier, we are advocating for um, e-commerce to be negotiated alongside the phase two uh, issues to fast track and speed up uh, uh, that uh, process. Um, as I've also said, we're doing analytical work on um, uh, trading services, uh, including on health and uh, education, on digital trade, uh, the distributional impacts, poverty, climate change, and uh, regional uh, value chains. Um, we continue to undertake uh, sensitization and advocacy events uh, to support the ratification process. And as I noted, about uh, 30, 34 countries accounting for 75% of um, Africa's GDP have already um, uh, ratified uh, the agreement. Let me also say that um, some of this work is being funded by the um, European Union. And, uh, and this is where also we see the disconnect uh, between the kind of development uh, support that Europe uh, is a model uh, of providing um, uh, as opposed to what its trade policy implications are, that kind of disconnect between the development arm of the commission and the trade arm of the uh, commission. And so we are in fact benefiting from uh, EU funding and uh, uh, some of this work that we're, we're doing. Um, we're supporting uh, national and regional implementation uh, strategies um, uh, for the um, for, for, for AFCFT implementation. And uh, here I could mention that we now are working with about 38 African countries with others in the uh, pipeline. Uh, several of these strategies have already been completed, others are in the uh, process. And um, we're also beginning to work with uh, uh, some of the RECs, uh, ECOWAS and ESC and ECAS in particular, uh, on a regional uh, AFCFTA strategy as well. Uh, in this work, we are strongly prioritizing um, distribution issues, uh, inclusion, gender, also climate change is uh, being factored uh, into this work and into the analytical uh, part. Um, uh, we are uh, trying to extend uh, understanding of the AFCFTA agreements through uh, capacity building interventions that we're making, especially through our training uh, institute in, in, in Dakar. Um, uh, also trying to build the skills of um, African researchers in regard to modeling uh, AFCFTA and, and other 
uh, trade issues, uh, but helping to create uh, a better understanding of trade policy on the continent. We're also aware that um, this is a very highly specialized areas, uh, area uh, with um, uh, seen by many as a kind of esoteric uh, specialization, but we're uh, through this kind of work, we're trying to help to demystify um, the way that trade policy uh, is looked at uh, on the continent. We certainly do believe that uh, the future of the continent is in trade. It is very clear that um, uh, development assistance is only a fraction of the gains that we're seeing uh, from trade. Uh, even today, uh, other um, uh, sources of uh, uh, inflows into the uh, continent, such as remittances, uh, already uh, dwarf uh, development assistance. So it's very clear that um, uh, this path of sustainability for the African continent uh, very much uh, depends on, 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 on trade. Then finally, we're working on this um, FCFTA business index, which will be our main tool for monitoring how well the FCFTA is working uh, or not working and um, generating the evidence uh, at country level, uh, at regional level, and also at continental uh, level. Um, so in conclusion then, um, my view would be that, uh, uh, that yes, uh, the Africa's uh, position in the global economy can be strengthened uh, if the AFCFTA is uh, fully uh, implemented, if Africa's uh, partners uh, can reverse the incentives that they are currently uh, that are currently in place, that is pulling uh, the integration effort apart, uh, that um, we can see uh, then um, an improvement in in Africa's uh, global uh, position. Uh, so I've come to the end of my presentation, and this last slide uh, will give you uh, some of the um, references that I have uh, uh, mentioned uh, that um, uh, on which uh, much of what I've said is anchored in terms of the evidence and the uh, uh, underlying empirical work that we have done to support uh, much of what I've said. So once again, uh, thank you to SEF for giving me this uh, platform to share our perspectives on, um, on, on this issue. And I look forward to uh, 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 a good discussion uh, of um, much of what I've, I've said. And I hope that I've been sufficiently controversial uh, yeah. to, uh, <laughs> to provoke uh, some questions uh, which I'll be delighted to take. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Mm -hmm.